Please welcome the Churchill Club Chairman of the Board, Avery Lyford. Good evening. I'm Avery Lyford, Chairman of the Board of the Churchill Club. Uh, welcome to the program, Unlocking Social Technologies, presented in partnership with uh, McKinsey Global Institute. Uh, it's been a great experience working with MGI, and I'd especially like to call out the help of Re Rebecca Roboy. And let us please welcome our distinguished set of speakers. We have Wendy Arnott from TD Bank Group, flew in just for this. BJ Fogg from Stanford's per Persuasive Technology Lab. Dave Gatilius from Jive Software. Clara Shi from Hearsay Social. And of course, our moderator, Michael Chewy from McKinsey Global Institute. Thank you all for being here. It is great to see such an amazing audience here. Remember that you're the reason we're holding this program. If a question that is not asked that you think should be asked, there will be Q&A at the end of the program. Please ask for a mic, and you'll get a chance to put that question to the panel. Our next program is on the evening of July 31st, next week, and we've got the Chief Marketing Officer agenda, which I'm sure social media may play some small part in. <laughs> With Chief Marketing Officer, officers from DreamWorks Animation, Google, Intuit, and SAP. I encourage you all to attend. That event will be down in Santa Clara. And then on the evening of August 20th, we've got a program about the future of conversing with technology, which has got an all-star roundtable, including Steve Wozniak. That program will be in Palo Alto. Finally, we've got a remarkable set of programs on Thursday, September 13th, First, it's a day-long program called Changing the Game. We'll unpack change for you and have insights in it with interactive breakaway sessions that focus, focus on such important megatopics as education, energy, healthcare, and others. That same evening, we're presenting the Churchill Awards, which are, is a program designed to inspire others by highlighting excellence in terms of leadership, innovation, collaboration, and societal benefit. Last year's winners included Microsoft for their Connect in terms of the teamwork that brought that together, Salman Khan for the Khan Academy, Elon Musk, and Facebook. This year's winners will be announced shortly. Be sure to mark your calendars for uh, both those events on September 13th. And those programs will be held down in Santa Clara. And then if you're tweeting, I want to, which of course you will be since it's about <laughs> social media, um, please use the hashtags Churchill Club and MCK Social, and you'll find other Twitter codes in your program. Now, let me introduce our moderator, Michael Chewy. Dr. Chewy is a, a principal and senior fellow of the McKinsey Global Institute, which is the think tank for McKinsey. Recently, uh, Michael was elected as a partner for McKinsey, and he travels, literally travels the world. Uh, <laughs> presenting research on major disruptive trends, including things like big data, the Internet of Things, and of course, social media. Please give the, your warmest welcome to Michael and the panel. Thanks, Avery. Thanks to uh, the Churchill Club, uh, Karen, and everyone else uh, for hosting. Thank you all for taking some time out of your uh, busy schedules to meet with us, and, and thanks to our panelists uh, for um, uh, coming here to educate and enter entertain, I'm hopeful. <laughs> um, just in terms of uh, what we're going to do today, um, I'm going to try to set the context a little bit in terms of uh, some of the research that, that we've done, uh, as well as some of the other things that we've discovered. Um, I want to spend some time talking with the panel up here on stage, and then, as Avery suggested, we're going to have a, an opportunity for, uh, for some of you to engage us. And then uh, a, a kind of something I like to do at the very end is uh, do a little lightning round. Uh, it's a little Jim Cramer type thing. Uh, where I'll ask a bunch of questions that uh, we'll want some quick answers from the panel from. So that's, that's what we'd like to do today, if you don't mind. I, I see some Jim Cramer negatives, but that's okay. We'll live with that. <laughs> um, so with that being said, you know, in the past 48 hours, there have been a number of different um, uh, reports uh, that have come out, a couple of earnings reports, which I will not address at all. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, and then uh, um, MGI, the McKinsey Global Institute, uh, 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 issued a report on, on, on um, the impact of social media. And I'm, I'm just going to cover a few highlights because the thing is uh, 160 pages long and I am not going to talk for four hours. So 
Uh, just just a, a few things that we discovered as we did this research. Uh, first of all, I, I think a lot of people would say, why are you guys studying social? I mean, isn't that over? I mean, yeah. don't, aren't we already in the negative phase about social? Um, our point of view is that not at all, that actually we're just at the very beginning of what's a multi-year trend. Um, and just as one piece of illustration, if you look at, we did this analysis about in the past 100 years, all the ways in which people communicate, collaborate, consume media, et cetera. If you look at all the words that impinge upon your life during a day, despite all of this media that we have about you know, social networks, et cetera, only about 5% of the words or 5% of the time that you spend or that we spend collectively on average is through social networks. And our point of view is that social is a feature, not a product. And so if you believe that you know, social can be added to pretty much any type of human interaction which is digitally mediated, then there's a huge amount of additional upside just in terms of the usage, despite the fact that some social platforms have you know, close to a, a billion users. There's still a lot of upside in terms of just a user adoption uh, and usage. But that being said, as part of you know, McKinsey and Company, we actually wanted to look at value. How do you create value using social? And so we looked in four deep dive domains. We looked at consumer packaged goods. We looked at consumer uh, financial industries. Uh, we looked at advanced manufacturing. And we looked at professional services. So a wide swath of the economy, not the entire economy, maybe about 20% of the revenues in the economy. But they varied. Some are products, some are services, some, are, you know, uh, some of them are consumer facing, some of them are, are more B2B. And, it, and when we looked at all those, we tried to understand at a very fine grain level, you know, we have this micro to macro methodology that we use. We want to look at hundreds of case studies and try to understand what is the potential for social to create value. When we actually looked across you know, that swath of the economy, just those four sectors, we saw the ability to create $900 billion to $1.3 trillion of annual value across the globe on just those four sectors. So, you know, a, a, a trillion bucks, that's decent, right? So there we think that's re, re, real and a real potential. Now, that being said, that's not going to happen tomorrow. There are a lot of things that have to happen. But the, the other thing that we discovered, because we looked across the value chain all the way from product development through you know, sales and marketing, customer service, et cetera, the other insight that we discovered as we analyzed this, if you take a look at all the ways in which you can create value through improved collaboration and communication within and across enterprises. That value, that value potential, it's, is twice that of all the other ways in which social can create value. Right? So as important as consumer marketing is, the deriving insight from sentiment analysis, uh, you know, being able to get messages out through social networks, et cetera, as, as much value as you can create there, again, two thirds of all the potential that we found uh, we're through improving collaboration and communication within and across the enterprise. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Now that being said, it's going to be hard to do, right? That's not necessarily easy to do, but why do we believe there's some potential? Well, something like 13 hours of every knowledge worker's work week is spent in email. Does that sound right to anybody? Right? Probably more. Yeah, this crowd, of course, <laughs> Bay Area, what can you say? <laughs> right? You know, 20% of the, your time looking for information and gathering it, right? Another 15% maybe collaborating with people internally. Do we think that there's a whole bunch of like organizational dark matter trapped within people's inboxes that if you actually, you know, communicated in a more social way that it, you could actually improve the productivity of these sorts of people? We think yes. But that being said, it's going to take some real transformations in organizations and culture, et cetera, in order for that to happen. So that's, that's you know, really quickly what, what's contained in some of the 160 pages that we have. So with that setting as the context, let me you know, just do a quick introduction of our, of our panel and, then, and get into the conversation. So Wendy to my left here uh, is the VP of Social Media and Digital Communications at TD Bank Group, which is one of the largest banks actually in uh, North America, based in Toronto. And, uh, over two decades of experience in corporate communications, amongst other things. BJ, uh, to her left, is the founder and director of the Persuasive Technology Lab at Stanford University, which sounds like something we should all learn about. You run Persuasion Boot Camps, which is even more powerful, and uh, authored a book uh, called Persuasive Technology, Using Computers to Change What We Think and Do. Uh, David Gutelius, uh, Gutelius over there, is the chief scientist at Jive Software, which is an uh, enterprise social company. Uh, you drive enterprise social graph strategy and technology innovation. And previously, uh, you've uh, had a background in machine learning and artificial intelligence, something I've 
had a background in as well, and social computing at the uh, somewhat well-known place called SRI. And then Clara Shai at the far left over there is the founder and CEO of Hearsay Social, another enterprise social company. Uh, you're on the board of uh, some small coffee company called Starbucks. And uh, also authored a best-selling book uh, called The Facebook Era, Tapping Online Social uh, Networks to Market, Sell, and Innovate. Did I just sell by mistake? I'm sorry. My bad. <laughs> All right, great. Why don't we get into the conversation then? Uh, BJ, why don't we start with you? So uh, you run the Persuasive Technologies Lab. We won't ask you to explain what that means exactly. But uh, you know, there's something to this social thing, right? I mean, for some reason, these are technologies which have been adopted faster than any other media in the world uh, in history. So why is that? What's going on? Well, I mean, something to the social, I think, is it's, uh, social is everything in some ways. I mean, as human beings, we're really wired to be pack animals. We're much more like dogs than cats. And yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm sorry for cat people out there. Um, <laughs> and our social world, what we perceive to be our social environment and our peers and whatnot, influence our behavior more than we imagine. And uh, we like to think that we're independent thinkers and we make our own decisions, but the fact of the matter is that our social context really controls a lot of our behavior. And so uh, in some ways, it's almost like, why did it take technology so long to get this social? Uh, it was almost like there's this weird blip in time where it wasn't social, and now we're finally back to who we are naturally. Now it changes how we behave and what we do in some ways that are not so great. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, we're very social. That's not a surprise to everybody. Um, and from here on out, we will be using technologies that are social, whether we like it or not. And what have you learned in the Persuasive Technology Lab that, wow. Not everything, just the good Wow. Things. Well, I started the lab in the 1990s, and it's all about uh, understanding how computer systems, computing systems, can be designed to change people's behaviors, what they think and do, in a good way, mostly. Some people see that in a negative way. And so some of my students have gone on to do some pretty interesting things with that. And um, what we do mostly now is teach people how behavior works and how to design systems that influence people in ways that you want and in ways that help them as well. Um, so it's that overlap between computing and persuasion. And when I first started doing the research on that in the mid-90s, people thought that was insane and crazy. And some people thought that was evil and I shouldn't be doing that. And, uh, but the experiments after experiments showed that computers could influence you. And then commercially things started happening and then people got over that and said, wow, how do we create stuff like this? Yeah. Clara, you founded a company and you studied another company that uh, you know, uses this social instinct and technology to, to persuade and do things. What, what is it that's compelling about this for business? I think you know, if we take a step back, we're, un we're witnessing a seismic shift in consumer online behavior where the proliferation of mobile devices and the incre increasing amount of time that people spend online is driving people less uh, towards search and owned media, meaning that it's going directly to, to companies' websites or media websites, and more to a world of sharing and discovery where they're checking their Facebook feed, their Twitter feed, their LinkedIn feeds first. And the implication of that is that increasingly, to BJ's point, it's our friends that are influencing what we do. We Increasingly, we are crowdsourcing what we read, what we buy, who we do business with, to the nodes in the social graph that we trust. And these are our friends, our family members, our colleagues, other entities that we choose to follow or subscribe to on these social media sites. And so that's why it's so significant I mean, in general, but specific to any business that wants to, be, wants to maintain and grow a mind share. So Wendy, you, you run social, basically, for a Big business. What? What? Where? Where are you seeing value? What? Uh, well, so many great opportunities. Um, one of the one of the things that uh, we've done that's a little unique is we've uh, enabled a social network within our company, which is about eighty five thousand employees, and it's an open, unmoderated social network where uh, employees can set up communities to collaborate on wikis and blogs and forums, and they can. Uh, share information and you know really uh, say what what they would like to say um, and, and use it in any way. So um, 
that might sound like a lot of risk, and particularly in banking, but um, we're seeing a lot of value. Um, right off the bat, I can tell you that a majority of the communities that employees set up are, are business focused. They are, they're not wasting their time, which is one of the things people worry about. They're, they're using it to um, capture uh, knowledge. So forget about the emails, as you were just saying. It's uh, such a great story. Um, if you can share in a network and put all of the updates that you have in that place, you don't have to have that inbox being filled up. And in, say you're off on vacation in San Francisco, uh, and you go back, you don't have that we big long. Here, by the yeah, way. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I'm in Toronto, so I'm not in the office. But my updates will be, and the dialogue that happens will be in the community when I go back. So yeah. I mean, there's so much um, value and opportunity that starts to come out of that. Is there anything that surprised you about where it was actually valuable? Then? Um, you know, I think we had this notion that because in retail banking you've got a lot of young employees in the branches, and so we had this notion that it was going to be the young people uh, and that it wouldn't really matter in head office. And actually quite the opposite is true. Um, certainly they, the, um, the retail employees really do like it and they like the access to head office and leaders and all of that, but what we really find is that the the people who are in head office who are like really have to make decisions using a lot of different specialty functions, if you will, are finding that great value in being able to come together in a community and collaborate and share. So we, we I mean, it makes sense now. Everything makes sense in social like a month later. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, when you think about it, it's all human behavior. But initially we thought it would be more adopted more quickly with the younger employees. Oh, interesting. So David, yeah. you supply you know, a, a lot of companies with the social technologies. Uh, what, what usage patterns are you seeing and what value patterns are you seeing? Where are you seeing people? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, one thing that we see is the importance of local cultures and culture really affecting not just usage of behavior patterns, but also um, how those communication technologies, these sharing technologies are actually put in practice into kind of workflows that make sense for a particular customer, right? So you could, you could have a, a kind of mixed bag of, of different features that get used in a certain way in say consumer retail customer. And you look at a financial services customer, um, you know, we've got a, a few, uh, for instance, uh, private banker communities, right? And their, their culture is quite different, and the way that they choose to not just communicate and signal to one another, but use certain kinds of features in ways we couldn't possibly design ourselves is really cool. Because you, what you do as, you know, as a technologist is you, you put out a bunch of possibilities for people. And really the magic happens when the humans come into the mix and start to actually change what you do, and of course what they do, hopefully, and that's where the value really really comes in. So Can you say more examples of how cultures are different that way, and, and how that's you know, affected the way that the technology has been used? Yeah, so um, go back to the, the uh, private banker example. So a bunch of invest in investment bankers in New York. We've got some very large customers in that sector, and all of them are very, they, they come to the table sort of very worried about what will happen, right? Yeah. And so they kind of tiptoe into the water, and typically we see this sort of explosion in usage in terms of these, these small groups. They kind of self-form in an ad hoc way, and they start solving problems. Well, the, the way that bankers do this uh, tends to be very hierarchical. So the way that they're signaling back and forth to one another, very def deferential for those above you in sort of the food chain. And the way that you signal and work with peers is actually quite different. Than by signaling what? It's the language that they use? Or? It's a combination of the language that they use, but also the t the how they use the tools themselves. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, lots of private messaging going back and forth inside of those communities that may result in something more visible, maybe once it's cured a little bit more versus uh, something a little bit more chaotic, especially in um, consumer retail is as good an example as any other, um, where you might get sort of an internal product company and it's in a mess. I mean, their ideation process and their product development process you know, often can be very, very chaotic, uh, sometimes very violent in, in terms of what happens, creative destruction, you know. Uh, and the communication patterns that you see there are 
very different. And so the tool you preference there then is like activity streams and very much more along the, the lines of kind of Facebook types of things where everything is visible. Everybody is watching what everybody else is doing. And eventually something comes of that. And it's really cool when those things sort of self-emerge. But really, it's, it's just fascinating to see how different these communities wind up being. I mean, we can, you know, we, we often deploy the same sort of standard set of tools out. And we give the same kind of best practices advice. But that only goes so far. It's all about what the customer then does, what the humans then do with that technology, where they take it. That's the exciting stuff. Claire, your business is in a number of different industries and now in a number of different countries. Are you also seeing differences in the way that it, it gets used and deployed, et cetera? Yeah, it's so interesting. So Hearsay Social, we're also an enterprise software company, but instead of focusing on internal communities, we work with Fortune 500 companies that have large networks of salespeople or local stores. So insurance is a big vertical for us, financial services, real estate, retail chains and franchises, multi-level marketing. So anytime you have a strong global or national brand combined with these local nodes. And what we're finding is that whether it's the private banker or the insurance agent or the store manager or even the customer who's checking into Foursquare or Yelp on their mobile phone, there's a proliferation of these local pages on LinkedIn, Facebook, Foursquare, Twitter, YouTube, you name it. And a lot of chief marketing officers don't even know that these local pages <laughs> exist, right? And so initially, Hearsay Social, our first, one of our first products was Rogue Page Finder. And it was just <laughs> indexing all of these so-called rogue pages and profiles and highlighting them for corporate. And there's all kinds of, you know, not just brand risk, but regulatory implications. Yeah. And then beyond that, now we help them manage it from a content perspective, analytics, and, and other aspects. But, you know, but, but to the point that was raised earlier, absolutely, the way that 24-hour you know, fitness on the retail side manages their local pages on Yelp and Facebook is very different than the way that the private bankers at a Wall Street firm manage their LinkedIn profiles. And yet, to your point, the underlying technology of hierarchy management, applying business rules, across a large number of local pages, it's all the same. Mm. It's just these different use cases. And ultimately, because these organizations make money in very different ways and, and have different kinds of customer relationships, transaction sizes and transaction frequencies, all of that gets reflected in the way that the tools are used. So BJ, I'm curious. Uh, all the other panelists have mentioned things that you know, have alluded to things that might go wrong. Wow. <laughs> so not to bring things down, but you know, in your you know experience, what what are some of the things that end up you know being an obstacle that d that don't work? Yeah. Um, wow, where should I go with this? How many people have had a, a, like a disaster on Twitter? You posted something, you're like, oh my gosh, seriously? Am I the only one? <laughs> Come on, panelists, no? A minor disaster. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like I have like one a week, <laughs> but maybe that's just lately. And I had a pretty bad one two weeks ago. And I think it's, I won't explain it because, you know, I shouldn't even have said that. Now you're going to look it up. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, but, but how many people here are even on Twitter? Okay. Okay. Get on Twitter. Okay. You are. Okay. okay. Take more risks, people. <laughs> anyway. Uh, at the beginning, I was actually sort of tracking and I was deleting 20% of everything I tweeted. Now I'm like, whatever. <laughs> it's just going to get buried under, hopefully, something. Um, the, the thing is, uh, it's, so social technologies make social interactions easier to do, and that's part of what makes them great. And they can scale, and that's part of what makes them great. And it's kind of permanent, and that's kind of what makes them both great and terrible. So all those things, easier to like, say something fast, and it scales. You know, you go, oh, I'm going to tweet this, come back after, and it's like, oh my gosh, this got totally retweeted, they misinterpreted me, and it's out there, and you just can't really recall it. So uh, the same things, it's like, wow, we have, we're, we're capturing knowledge, and they're sharing, and people can go back and see it later. That's also some of the downside. And um, I'm not exactly sure what the answer is to some of those things, and I can't believe there have, you guys aren't just, you're not confessing. We, yeah. You will have disasters on Twitter and other places. Maybe not. Maybe you have better judgment than I do. So th th there's, there's a set of things that can go wrong in terms of things spiraling out of control. Is there, are there also a set of things that you, know, you just don't d achieve a critical mass? And how do you deal with that? You know, I don't look so much about 
deployment inside enterprise. I, I'm more on the mm -hmm. consumer side but of on things. The consumer but side. what I do know, because I'm doing a lot more work in health and helping people design health programs, uh, wellness programs inside. And um, there's a real suspicion in some companies where the employees are like, who are you, boss people, you know, executive managers, to tell me what I should be doing in my home or what da 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 da. So um, that's still an unsolved problem for some companies. You know, how do you convey genuine um, that you really want them to be healthier, just for their benefit and also for the bottom line. Uh, and it's a problem that people are still working on. Um, when it's been solved, how did you solve it? Well, um, what I do is I teach the, the key thing, one of the key things is it's not about technology anymore. And the persuasive technology lab really was like, isn't it fascinating that technology can influence you? And that's no longer fascinating, that's ordinary. Uh, so the thing that is missing is clear thinking about behavior and how behavior works. And so what companies almost always, whether it's a startup or a larger company, what they don't do cleanly is say, here's the behavior we want, boom. They'll say, we want engagement. Or we're doing a campaign, and I'm like, yeah, that's fine, but what behavior do you want? So part of the first steps to achieve success is what is it that you want people to do? Do you want them to answer a survey? Do you want them to uh, join a challenge, issue a challenge, and so on? There are some grassroots systems that help solve that, so people feel like they're deciding what they're doing with their peers rather than it being directed to them. So one day, uh, when I think about industries that worry about risk, mm -hmm. banks, banks come up occasionally. Oh <laughs> um, can you talk about you know, how there are things that people worry about. So what, what, what do you worry about at the bank, and how have you addressed those? What I worry about is not enough social, but what uh, some of the bankers worry about is um, definitely, you know, customer privacy, absolutely paramount, can't, cannot cross that line. And that line, you know, I think is, is, uh, is very fine. And, and uh, so if you're going to respond to someone who has an issue and you've found them and they haven't actually proactively come to you, then that could be considered... Uh, is, that, is that an invasion of, of their privacy? But anyways, they, they don't worry so much about that. They worry about the customer data and their account information. And uh, as well, you know, we're a large publicly traded company, so we worry about um, our employees and what's sharing confidential information about the company, so customers and company information. Um, you know, I think initially uh, there's also that question internally about productivity, you know, will employees you know, uh, waste their time chatting about, you know, the bachelorette <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> For instance. Uh, but, but that doesn't really happen, and, and what we definitely find is um, uh, two things. We trust our employees to talk to customers in branches and on the phone by the thousands every single day. So we can actually trust them to talk to each other every single day on our internal social network. Like, it's, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's kind of a deep tradition at TD. We've, um, we've always kind of encouraged our employees to speak, so it isn't like we turned on internal social networking and then suddenly the culture became one of transparency and, and, and sharing. That was a, a culture that we've now amplified using social. Um, but there's, you know, people worry about risks all the time, and, and uh, I think the, the, the way that I've approached it in the company is to try to say, okay, what are the real risks associated with social? Um, business has risk, you know, even though we're bankers and we're risk adverse, any business, you're going to take a risk or you're not going to get anywhere. So, you know, what are the ones that we're taking on because we're getting involved in social that are different and unique? Let's understand what those are, and then you know, let's either choose to put mitigations or constrain our implementation against those particular ones. And when you really do that, you find that there's already risk. I mean, people can come in, uh, you know, they could lose their laptop and lose all kinds of data. They could um, go set up a Facebook group and you know, share all kinds of info. You know, when you really get down to it, the the risks are quite small, and you have to be very careful and it's to me it's about customer information and data. Mm. Claire, I'm interested because y your company sort of fits uh, you know in between consumers and the enterprise etc. Who, who which which population is harder? I don't know about harder. I mean, I think there there are two sides of the same coin mm. and it's because there's a billion users on social media sites, social networking sites that precisely makes it so appealing 
for businesses across various industries. Um, I mean, just to add to, to Wendy's point, I mean, there's, it's ultimately about what is the value that you can create on both sides. I mean, consumers know that they're giving up privacy when they add all this information on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, but there's a reason they do it. They do it because they get value back. The value they get back is the ability to connect more deeply with their friends, to stay in touch with their family members and colleagues, even when they're in remote areas. It's the ability to express themselves and say, yes, I like this brand, or yes, I follow this particular celebrity. The same thing is true on the brand side. There's, there are risks, but to Wendy's point, the optimal level of risk for, for businesses or for in general is rarely zero. And so what are they getting in exchange for the risk and how do they mitigate those risks? And typically, you know, that, that's the, the billion dollar or the trillion dollar question, which I, I agree with you, Michael, we're only just scratching the surface of unlocking the tremendous value creation on the social graph. I mean, today we're talking about brand advertising, that is upper funnel, upper marketing funnel types of activities, but actually, if you understand human behavior, both within and external to the company firewall, there is a lot of transactions and communications and collaboration to be done across you know, marketing, sales, customer service, and reaching into the back office. So that's super intriguing, right? So what, what would it mean to be farther down in the funnel rather than in the, in the big, big part of it? Well, you know, there is the, you start with awareness. And so, you know, the, a lot of people talk about um, how GM pulled their ad campaigns from Facebook the week before the IPO. And, you know, of course, if you compare brand ads, whether it's on social media or some other medium to search, you're never going to get the same results because it's apples versus oranges. You know, you're comparing someone who does not have search intent or purchase intent to someone who's actually searching for a car or searching for a GM vehicle. So of course there's gonna be a much higher click through. So I think um, what's gonna happen is that over time, social is gonna get closer to the transaction. A lot of our customers do this by you know, marrying social data with driving the productivity of their salespeople and driving store visits, driving bigger transactions. Um, but certainly that's happening on e-commerce. And there's also no reason why social couldn't converge with search. I mean, today those are two separate worlds. You live in social media and then you separately search, usually on Google. But why shouldn't those two be together? Why shouldn't we live in a world where if I search for a digital camera, I'll get a very different set of search results than my 11-year-old niece who loves pink and loves Hello Kitty and has hopefully less money than me, it's a lower <laughs> price point, versus my husband's cousin who is a professional photographer. If he searches for a digital camera, why shouldn't, they, why shouldn't he see an ad that's a professional camera just for him? All that data is out there, and as long as we can figure out the privacy issues that Wendy talked about, that's a better experience on both sides because it's higher conversion and it's also more targeted and relevant for the consumer, and I think that that gets us closer to the holy grail of marketing, which has always been to deliver the right message to the right person at the right time. And by the way, search on social platforms seems to be horrible. Does anyone else <laughs> find that to be true? Yeah. <laughs> we have a long way to go. <laughs> okay. uh, David, I'm curious. I mean, it, the, the, this idea of measurement has come up, right? Which is, you know, how, how do you find out that actually you are capturing value? Are, are you finding anything? You're the chief scientist after all, so. Yeah. <laughs> now the burden After all, to prove it, huh? yeah, that, that made it sound a little too. So, low. so yeah, I, I think um, we've certainly come uh, a long way in terms of being able to measure the effect on, say, things like productivity, how fast things get done, tasks get completed. Um, some measures are easier to observe than others. So, you know, for instance, one of our um, big customers, uh, T-Mobile. Um, you know, found using Jive, kind of discovered these, again, these use cases themselves, but, um, you know, found they could cut their time to issue resolution by using this particular approach to uh, problem solving, social problem solving in a sense, um, you know, by a factor of something like 10. Uh, and it was literally, the CEO told us, you know, millions of dollars a year, just that one use case. Other things are much harder to measure. Right? So in terms of, you know, people often try to make this argument email versus something social. 
well, what they're doing on social is not necessarily <laughs> any better than what they did on, on email. So just the fact that they're switching tools or channels to do things doesn't necessarily tell us very much. We actually need more information to be able to say something substantive about change over time. And so what we're trying to do at Jive is build up a sort of set of use cases, both on the external side. So about half of our business is serving uh, companies like Apple and Nike um, on their external communities. Uh, and then half of business is sort of internal collaboration. So you can imagine different ways of measuring value in, in those different kinds of settings. And I think we're actually pushing the envelope in some pretty interesting ways. I was just um, discussing at dinner earlier some of the uh, a fairly minor breakthrough we had this uh, week with the data science group uh, and being able to sense meaningful clusters of activity inside of a community and starting to interpret what those clusters and the emergence of those clusters over time could mean for whether it's a, a Nike or a T-Mobile in terms of internal collaboration could mean for dollar value. So can you say, what does that mean? What, what are meaningful clusters? Yeah, yeah. so um, what we see is that, you know, if you could imagine over time, uh, oftentimes a pattern you see in more successful communities is you have little clusters of people. Everyone doesn't rush in at once and everything is suddenly beautiful. It's usually, and Wendy can probably attest to this, this kind of process that you go through. And, you know, every company takes a different journey to that point. And so, you know, as a, a vendor, what we would like to do is pe help people get up that value curve as quickly as possible. One way to do that is to sense when something interesting is beginning to happen. So as human beings, we need models, it turns out. We, we need people to follow. <laughs> we need to figure out how to use tools. We need to figure out sort of the cultural norms in any community. And a lot of these communities, again, whether it's external or internal, is about watching what other people do and asking ourselves, is this a place where I can imagine myself giving of, of myself, trusting what's going on here, building a sort of online identity inside this new place? And so being able to sense when signaling patterns, whether it's linguistic or um, you know, in the types of activity people are undertaking, those combinations of patterns tell us something about how much people trust what's going on there and whether or not they will be likely to come back and, and do more. And so we're beginning to build a sort of library of probabilities where we see a certain pattern forming. You know, we have a sense that this is either sort of moving in the right direction or maybe moving in the wrong direction. Um, and it's, I mean, it's fascinating, this is a social scientist, it's fascinating to see some of these things emerge in ways that, again, are, are pretty unpredictable in some ways. And the people vote for, with their feet. So they tell us exactly what they think is valuable in the community you know, through the data. But, but, but there's also, and I'm not saying Jive does this, but <laughs> technology can give sort of a social reality distortion. And let me give an example. I won't say, uh, when you go to Facebook and you look at your feed, you see uh, entries and posts from people who are active on Facebook. So say you have 800 friends right. on Facebook. Let's say only 150 are really active. You're not thinking of the 650 who didn't post, and you're not thinking of the 200 have completely dropped off. So by clever design, Facebook and other <laughs> solutions will give you the impression that all your friends are really active and posting, and they're disclosing lots of information, and they're participating, and so on. And that's kind of a, it's a distortion of reality, but it changes how you think about your social world, and it gets you to behave differently. So how, how do you deal with that distortion? Or should well, we deal if, with that Well, if you're a product creator, you want to create for that, right? I mean, if the behavior Actually, is, you, we you want people to <laughs> post, to comment, yeah. you model that. You, you, and you highlight the people who are doing that, and you don't say, oh, here are your 400 friends that haven't been back here in four weeks. Yeah. So I think this is a, a, what I see as a real difference between the consumer space mm -hmm. and trying to serve an enterprise market with some of the same kinds of technologies, social technologies. We're in, on the enterprise side, we actually really have to care about not just the volume of stuff being shoved at people, but ask ourselves, you know, and hope our customers will tell us, are they getting the right things? Are they actually yeah. using those tools to become productive and not just Facebook for, you know, the enterprise? So again, whether it's external or internal. We, we want to show activity, yes, 
but it has to be the right activity. Well, it's got to be the meaningful activity or else we're failing. Or accurate. So let me give another example that was new to me. Last. So I ran a boot camp last week, and one of the people that came was an MD working on communities and, and people dealing with cancer. And his point, and I didn't get this, but it fits the pattern, was when you have these online communities and people sharing with each other how they're dealing with cancer, so whatever chronic disease, mm -hmm. the people that are posting in most active are not representative of all those types of patients. Right. And the people that are most critical are not online posting. And so it gives kind of a distorted yeah. piece of information. So one of the things he's trying to figure out is how do you balance that back out? Yeah. Because unlike Facebook, where it's you know, kind of sort of trivial, it's pretty important when it comes you've got cancer and you're trying to decide on what is the right treatment. Yeah. But ultimately, in any type of community, and I think this is true, although I don't have the data in off, on, sorry, on offline in-person worlds versus online, is you see this pyramid of engagement where at the bottom of the pyramid you have most, most of the people are lurkers. They're just going there. 70% mm -hmm. of people on Twitter have never tweeted more than once. Right. So they're just following other people. Right. They're, not, they're content consumers, not content producers. And that, that's okay. Yeah. And that, you know, as you go up, there's, there's people who, they're the likers and they're, they're the commenters. They're not usually, or they're the retweeters. They're not originating net new content, but maybe they're curating and kind of adding their two cents. And then at the, the top of the pyramid, the fewest number of people are the ones who are creating. And I think that's just kind of nature. Um, but maybe there are ways that you can persuade the top to be a little bit bigger or you know, move people up that chain and encourage the people who are talking a lot to maybe talk a little bit less and yield to other people. Uh, that would be interesting to see. But that, 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 those dynamics happen you know, at a cocktail party, too. There's I mean, always that guy or that girl who's dominating the conversation. And there's some people who just, they're wallflowers or they tend to listen. They're still valuable parts of the community. Yeah. Wendy, do you see any uh, social distortion fields happening within the bank? Um, it gets talked about a lot. Um, we, we originally started our social journey just by having commenting on news articles. And definitely, that was one of the uh, executive pushbacks. Well, it's only the, you know, whatever. Call them the naysayers, the this people, the that people who are commenting. So we did some experimentation, like running focus groups uh, with peop like representative groups, just to balance that out and say, well, is this true? Is this reflective? And in generally, we found it was reflective. I don't know about in cancer research, but in terms of people's opinions on policies and dialogues that we were having, it, it seemed to be reflective. But I, I think it's really what, what Clara said is, is so true. I mean, probably even in this room, there would be a few people who will ask questions and many people that, you know, will participate by, you know, learning and, and being part of this conversation. And so I think, I don't know, I think it's, uh, it's true that in real human behavior, not everybody is a contributor. Is, is that self-selection bias to the extent to which there is one? Is that, is that problematic, right? That there is this top of the, pyra top of the pyramid, I guess. <laughs> Uh, the is one it a problem at a, at a cocktail party? I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of how humans behave. It's some yeah. people are louder and other people are quieter, and that's great. I mean, you need that diversity in the sort of the crowd, or else everybody's just talking at the same time and nobody's listening. I've been at cocktail parties like that. Not that. <laughs> 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 you were that one. <laughs> Let me come back to, a, a, David, a point that you made before, and I'm curious if people on the panel have had a uh, solution to it. I mean, one of the things that we identified in our research is a, a technology problem, which is how do you, if, if there's this torrent of information that's being made social, how do you make sure that the user gets what is relevant to them, right? And so. I'm wondering if anyone has any ideas. That's really something that actually our head of, of data science is here too, Greg. Um, we've done a lot of analysis in terms of from a business value perspective, what are the updates and who are the people that you care about? And it's different than the social graph that you care about you know, when you're home mm -hmm. or when you're yeah. you know, not thinking about work. And so well, what we've done algorithmically is we've developed, the engineering team rather has developed these ways to identify important events that are usually triggers for our customers. And it's different by different verticals, but I'll just talk specifically about insurance and financial services. It turns out that a lot of the life updates that people share on the social networks, whether it's you know, moving to a new city, having a child, getting married, getting a new job, that is like precisely, it's, it's, it's a gold mine for anyone who's a private banker, insurance agent, or realtor. Right? 
And so we've been able to, to figure out algorithmically, how do we bubble up those updates and notify the agent or the private banker, whomever it is, so that if they can only have five business lunches in a week and if they can only have 10 calls in a certain day, how, are, how do they make sure that they're calling on the right people at the right time? Mm -hmm. And so just driving that productivity up so that it's, it's just a higher ROI. Wendy, are there any techniques um, that you use to make sure that the people get the right information at the right time? Yeah, and, and we're actually finding that it's helping get the right information internally. So a, a great example is um, our, 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 so we're right across Canada, so I'll talk about Canada for a second, and each uh, part of Canada would be divided into a district, and you'd have a district manager. And that manager, he wouldn't be able to get to all of his branches. He probably has 20 branches. He's going to get into them maybe once a month. Um, also, in uh, going across Canada are wonderful people who are kind of the sales leaders for the various products. And what they want is shelf space in the minds of all of our retail employees. So the traditional way is that they pump out emails. And so now, you know, how many products do we have? A lot. So how many of these sales leaders do we have? A lot. And so your email bin, if you're a poor retail person trying to serve customers, it could be like 40 emails. And how do you choose what to pay attention to in that world? It's not easy, and generally the answer is you don't, right? You don't. Everybody's the same, right? You, you paid attention to the three that were at the top of the inbox, and the rest went down, and you served your customers, and you went on with your day. So now what uh, sales leaders are doing is they, they tell all of the, um, sorry, the, the district manager is doing is tells all the sales leaders, use the community, you got something to say to my people, you're gonna put it in the community. I'm going to comment on the ones that I think are the most relevant and I'm going to recommend the ones that I think are most relevant. And he's got all of his branches now using that as a place to, to curate the information and, and areas of focus. So um, first of all, he's saying that saves his people time because some of them might have been going through all those emails. But more importantly, he's in control of the information and the areas of focus of his people. So that's, I think, a, a phenomenal use case. And I think my biggest challenge right now is how can I get every single one of those managers doing it? Because it's, you know, we're getting these great cases coming up, but we need to get it out more into uh, more people doing that kind mm -hmm. of behavior. Uh, you bring up the idea of leadership here, right? And mm -hmm. these are social technologies after all. So uh, I don't know, Vijay, do you want to talk about what, what does leadership mean in, in, a, in a social technology world? I'll take that question and twist it around a little bit. Uh, I think it means in a, let's take a setting of a meeting. How many of our meetings have been less than good because people are using social technologies during the meeting face to face. Uh, in my class at Stanford, I guess I show leadership. The students aren't happy with this necessarily, but I'm making sure they get their money's worth. It's no laptops. You close them during class. And during the break, you can open them. And no phones, you listen. And oh, we need to take notes. No, just learn it, right? You guys are smart. You can learn this stuff. So um, I think what Maybe somebody solved this, but I, I haven't heard of it. We, we, we need to develop sort of a set of principles or practices so our productivity with old-fashioned kinds of things like face-to-face -face meetings doesn't get wasted. Okay, let's do this experiment. How many of you, I know, this, this could totally fail. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> In the last, what, 20, 30 minutes we've been talking, how many of you have actually not been fully, no, don't raise your hand be, uh, yet. Okay, good. We have a very honest person in the crowd. How many of you, I mean, it's like with technology, well, we'll do the little, okay, here's what we'll do. Because, uh, because I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm really good at keeping confidences. We'll have everybody close your eyes briefly and then raise your hand if you actually checked email or did Facebook or did something non-relevant to this moment. Panelists, close your eyes, turn off the TV cameras, ready? Go. How many people checked out? Okay, put your hands down. Okay, panelists, what do you think? 20, 30 percent? Okay. It's sort of like with these technologies, and I don't know exactly what the solution is, you're never fully away from work or away from the family, but you're never fully present at work or present with the family. And it's this really kind of weird new limbo state that we don't have a way to deal with yet, or a graceful way. 
I'm curious, what does the rest of the panel think? Uh, on an individual basis, the use of this stuff. I turn off my phone and my laptop when I go on vacation. I am off grid. <laughs> <laughs> I try to, and the first 24 to 48 hours is really hard, because you, yeah. you think about it, you reach for it, and then after that, it, it's good. I, I think <laughs> BJ is absolutely right, and in many ways, you know, smartphones are to blame. First, it was there's a reason why they called it the Crackberry, is because it's so gratifying. <laughs> there's always an email there waiting for you, and now Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn with with newsfeed, which I mean we take for granted now, but that was a, a revolutionary new feature when Facebook introduced it in 2005. Those of you who were on Facebook back then may recall. You know, millions of people quit Facebook because they felt like it was this huge invasion, invasion of privacy that whatever activities they were doing on Facebook would be automatically broadcast to their friends. And yet, yet now it's become, all those people have signed back up, and yet it's now become a core feature of a lot of applications. But the, the ramification of that is that it's even more gratifying because you know every single time you, you open your phone, there's going to be something new from somebody somewhere in the world. Slot machine psychology. Yeah, exactly. That's, right. yeah, yeah. that's what's going yeah. on. Yeah. Which, which is what you teach at the Persuasive Technology <laughs> Lab, as far as I can tell. Among that's what they really do. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, any thoughts on a personal level? How, how, how do you deal with this stuff? Uh, well, I, I, I'm a little bit addicted to the whole space. I mean, I don't actually mind using my BlackBerry or, um, yeah, we have to use BlackBerries because it's a bank and all that. But uh, I, don't, I don't mind using it. Um, I, I keep in contact most of the time. Um, my role, it's, it's a bit of a new role, so I do have accountability for you know, implementing these things. But I also have accountability for all the operations. So you, know, you said the Twitter crisis. Well, I personally haven't had one, but I've dealt with many uh, even this week. So you, know, you kind of have to be on it. kind of goes with the space. I, I, I don't mind it. But, to your point about not being fully there, I do think that is definitely a challenge from a personal point of view, but I think it's a great opportunity from a marketing point of view. Mm -hmm. So how do you, you know, if we're watching uh, television and in the past we just run our 30 second spot, now how do you incorporate some social element and, and be part of the experience with, um, with, the, with the consumer? So those are really interesting things to think about uh, from the marketing point of view. I think this is a perfect point now that we've actually started some audience interaction to, uh, to invite <laughs> some questions. So um, there are s at least uh, a couple of mics available for people to, uh, to, to m make BJ close his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Please, go ahead. So I, I'm marketing side, print, demographics, trying to get the psychographics, social media, no demographics, no psychographics, a lot of noise out there. How do we know who we're communicating with? It's a lot cheaper, I, I give you that, but I don't know who I'm communicating with. Yeah, there's a community, but a community of who? I would disagree. I think, um, let me first just say that social networking is distinct from social media. Social media, blogs, communities, wikis, YouTube, they all existed before social networking. And, and you're right, it was hard to know who you were communicating with because largely the users were anonymous. They would sign up for a profile, but it was you know, John Doe 82 or Bunny 772. You, know, you didn't really know who these people were. Social networking is very different. Social networking, the social graph, is built upon the notion of online identity. I mean, that was what made Facebook so different than every website before and then subsequently LinkedIn and Twitter. You sign up as a real person and there's an etiquette that's implicit in the network. There's a culture where you ought to only initiate and accept friend requests from people that you actually know offline. And so um, there's a lot of demographic and psychographic information on Facebook. In fact, that's how Facebook and, and more recently LinkedIn, that's how they monetize, is that they sell, they have an advertising platform where because they have so much profile information about you know, where you, who you are, where you're from, who you, um, where you went to school, what you studied, what your job is, your age, your favorite books and movies, all of the brands and organizations and politicians that you like, 
your religious views, your sexual orientation. Basically, this is like the Facebook profile creation wizard. They extract all of this information from you. And what happens is advertisers, anyone can go to facebook.com slash ads. What you can do is you can create a, what they call a hyper-targeted campaign against as narrow or as broad of an audience profile as you want. So I'll give you an example. If you are a golf, um, if you're a golf store, you can create ads and target them specifically to people who are aged you know, 25 to 45, who live in San Francisco or within 20 mile radius, who are male and who belong to a certain country club, and oh, by the way, that they have expressed on their profile as part of their identity that they love to golf. And you can target their friends. And so that's actually really powerful, and that's something that marketers could never, could never do before. So I think um, maybe traditional social media, you didn't know who you were dealing with, but we're, we're entering an era now, and why so many marketers are excited is because there is all this customer data that you can, you can target, or what they call it, hyper-target against. I love that, but they don't have that on me at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have that on a billion people, so. <laughs> well, but, but let's, let's. I actually, as, as a big data guy, I can tell you that they actually don't have that data on a billion people. And the data quality is, uh, you know, I think what you're hearing is there's a certain level of frustration with the quality of data that you get out of these systems. And, you know, it's, it's true to a certain degree. We all sort of lie on our, our, our online profiles, even though we don't mean to. You know, on the other hand, big data gives you the ability to infer a whole bunch more That's true. than we ever could before through you know filling out forms about ourselves and, just, and, and that's actually yeah. the scary part from a technology standpoint. That's true. It's, it's big data, and, and I guess it's not like we lie. Just to add to that, I agree. I think it's a lot of what people share on their profiles is aspirational. You know, that's what they. That's how they want. To You're be marketing, branded. aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> they, they want their friends or the the girl or, or guy that they want to date to view them that way. And so there is an interesting, um, yeah. there's, there's, there's interesting data there that also can be mined. And maybe it's not directly targeting someone who says that they like golf because those people don't actually golf. It's, it's through some other correlative means. Right. Yeah, how many people have put on their status update, it's just a really boring day? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Oh, sorry. I will. <laughs> Okay, um, I forget which one of you said it, but you said that the social media is really deepening people's relationships, and I have to take issue with that. I think it's in shallowing people's relationships, <laughs> broadening them out, but not making them any deeper. And I'm wondering, I forget which one of you commented on that, but which whichever one of you would like to comment on that. Um, I see my relationships, especially online, as being much less deep than they are in person, and much less deep than they are over email, but they're much broader. I hear a lot more from a lot more people. But, uh, not necessarily stuff I want to know. <laughs> well, 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 not only that, and I'll take it one step further. The quality of your best relationships is getting worse, and you're managing 800 loose ties. So you're managing a bunch of loose relationships at the expense of the relationships that matter most. Yeah. Yeah, I Because I, I don't think our capacity as humans is increasing that much to really you know, connect with the three or four people who are really important and then also have, I don't know, like some, you know, with all of these things, like the, the, uh, the advantages, if you look at the underside, and I like that the report's about value creation and not value destruction. It's kind of fun to do the hand wringing and that kind of thing, but um, there's value creation too. But yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. And I think um, it's, it's just like making those rules about meetings and yeah. social media that I think we will get smarter in the future and understand, uh, and hopefully the technology will help us to prioritize relationships and to enrich the ones that really matter. Yeah. And uh, I guess I'll say this, in the last two weeks I've been going through and unfriending, so my feed gets better tuned. They took away some of the tuning features. That's and why you unfriended me. Sorry, <laughs> if I unfriend you. It's not that you don't matter, you just don't matter as much, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> See, Twitter disaster. Not sure any better. <laughs> We've created a disaster even in real life. It's, it's great here. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I guess a, a, 
a slightly different variant of that. If everything both of you said I agree with, the interesting thing I've seen in my own network is, yes, it's, it's about these broader, shallower relationships. I've actually weirdly developed quite close ties with people I couldn't have met any other way. Um, and I'm not sure how universal that experience is necessarily. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a much heavier Twitter user, for instance, than I am Facebook. Um, the people that you know, I, I generally interact with on Twitter are peers, colleagues. It's, it's a pretty professional network. Facebook tends to be more sort of personal friends, people I know in my personal life. So those are sort of bifurcated in a way. Um, and I'll tell you, the people that I've met professionally through that, that other kind of social network, it's been astounding. As someone who you know, tries to keep up in their field and does whatever he can to do that, um, it winds up being a great way to do that, sort of keep in touch in a lightweight way with how people are thinking in, in that network I care about. And then again, I, I have these experiences where I actually develop very close relationships with a few key people in their network. And that wouldn't have been possible three years ago. So do you do that with all the Twitter, or do you find that once you start developing a relationship at a certain level, you move off of that platform? Oh, move off deeper? of it as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we obviously continue that you know, lightweight channel, uh, but it's, it's all about developing the human relationship. Uh, it's actually a combination. It's a combination of things, yeah. Just to offer a slightly different perspective, I think it all depends on how you use the technology. I mean, sure, if you have 5,000 friends on Facebook, it's going to be very dilutive. But if you're more selective or you use friend lists, like that's like a kind of an advanced tip. Like my closest friends I add onto a Facebook friend list. And so when I log in in my stream, that's what I click first so that I'm seeing their updates. And then sometimes if I'm bored, then I'll look at everybody else that Facebook <laughs> pushes to me. Um, but for just speaking personally, I, my relationship with my mom has gotten much closer. She lives in Chicago. You know, whatever, for whatever reason, that two hour difference is just enough that we don't get to talk quite as often as possible. I don't really have time or think to upload photos and email them to her, but I'll put them on Facebook and she'll interact with them. And it's been, it's been great. It's really been additive versus a uh, replacement to the mm -hmm. kinds of typical interactions that she and I have. Next question. Yeah, a very inter interesting discussion, so thank you. Um, we've talked about the internal collaboration, we've talked about external collaboration. I'm just curious on your thoughts or experience in connecting the two, because I think most organizations today are very client-focused, and yet so much of the internal organization doesn't have the opportunity to have that interface. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's cool. I think that's that, I mean, that's what I'm thinking about. That's what we're thinking about. That's once you see the power of the internal collaboration, all you, you first of all, the, the walls start to come down. So if I'm in marketing, I'm using advertising agencies and um, social agencies and all sorts of, so right away, my network uh, for whatever project I'm on isn't big enough. I need to be able to bring in those vendors. So how do we do that and how do we do that in a secure and safe way? And then in terms of collaborating with customers, um, we were seeing that, so we, we're definitely doing customer care, so you have a problem, you can tweet us, but what we're seeing is that there's uh, a lot of, there's lots of forums and blogs and places where people can go to get advice, but not a lot of those are credible. So in other words, you don't know the expertise of the person that's giving you advice. So what we're experimenting with, and I mean, this is only a few months old and we're just you know, just learning, uh, but we're experimenting with having an expert community on our dot com uh, so that customers can come in, they'll ask their questions about, you know, whatever financial matter they have. We have experts that are actual product experts there. They'll join in the conversation, but we're also having the community, um, whoever they are, uh, joining in and they're offering their advice. But at least you know, first of all, it's credible because it's not just the bank talking and providing one set of views, um, but you know that that is an expert opinion, and then you're allowing other people and uh, other customers. The interesting thing that we weren't expecting with this is that because it's so real time, uh, it's very uh, often market event based or you know situational context based, what's happening is those same questions are being asked of our people in the branches. And what we're starting to see now is 
employees in the branches looking at this online community to see <laughs> what questions are being asked um, and then seeing that expert answer and being in real time ready and equipped to answer those questions in real time. So there's a real convergence of all of these internal, external, and then uh, partner relationships that are possible. It's, it's very exciting. I couldn't agree more. I mean, there's so much crossover, and that's good because those are efficiencies. I mean, there's certain risks that are introduced, but those can be worked through. I mean, just looking at the organizations that we work with, because of their distributed nature, from the very beginning, our software has had to enable crossover workflows where, yes, we're enabling the local store page or the local insurance agent to talk through their, their customer, but sometimes those interactions have to get routed internally to compliance or legal for review, or sometimes the, the content that they're posting in the first place, some sort of viral video or a white paper, that's not something that the local user has time to create. It's something that's centrally created by marketing or by a research division, and then there's a workflow around suggesting that content to a content library that a local user can access. And so we see that all of the time, and then the, tr the key is, I guess, figuring out how to make that workflow as seamless as possible while adhering to either firm policy or etiquette or um, the different cultures and rules and regulations that would apply to internal versus external communications. Yeah, we see the same thing um, at Jive. One of the coolest uh, things that I'm seeing over the past probably two years is this uh, growing notion of co-creation. So product teams actually creating new products with customers and getting into not just the dialogue about, you know, here's some ideas you can throw out, but actually an active project together and creating whole new products out of that process. Nike is a great example of that. Um, a lot of the, the newest kind of um, uh, quantified self types of technologies came out of those kind of co-creation sessions with actual consumers. Can you say more about what that means to the non-geeky people? Or quantified self? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so Nike Plus Small. was probably the first, uh, I think, version of this. Little thing, device that fits in your shoe and tracks everywhere you go. Um, Fitbit has a little wristband, Nike now has a wristband, there are lots of these little wristbands you can wear, and basically they pick up, their sensor devices, they pick up, uh, you know, pulse rate and various other vitals, and then the best of them Bluetooth that out to, uh, a, a, you know, a, a wireless um, router where you can save that information, chart it, it's very cool. Uh, but the twist with Nike is actually nice because you can compare your stats with others and compete and do all these things. So from a persuasive technology standpoint, it's pretty cool. And just to share another completely different example of that, I was just thinking, at our company, we do a lot of our internal collaboration through a wiki, and each employee has a wiki user profile. And so for the longest time, our, our poor HR team begged every single person in the company to fill out their profile, upload a picture, write about their hobbies, because we wanted our employees to get to know each other. And it was just, it was a losing battle, because uh, for whatever reason, people just did not want to go through this process, even though um, you would think that everyone would want to get to know each other. It was just this added step. And so what we decided to experiment with was we said, look, all of our employees are on Facebook, and they have very vibrant profiles, and maybe there's, you know, hopefully they'd want to share it with their colleagues. Maybe there's pieces that they don't, and they can, they can adjust the privacy settings as such. And so what we did was we created a private Facebook group, and that's become our internal company collaboration, communication. You know, here we're playing basketball. Here's a great article that we read. There's different threads and forks. People can comment and like, and they can click through to see their colleagues' Facebook profiles and really get to know these people. And as those get updated in real time, their colleagues can see that, and it's become very vibrant. I'd say over 90% of our employees, you know, right, Greg? 90% of our employees, at least, are on those sites, and it's been especially important for remote employees yeah. who we don't see face-to-face -face every day. Right. Right. That was a huge problem for us. <laughs> Next question. Hi, good evening. My name is uh, Andrew Scott, and I run a, a startup called Taploid. Um, traditionally, LinkedIn has been for business and Facebook's been for personal. But maybe it's just because I work in tech, but I've seen this, this collision between my business life and my personal life where I've got sort of VCs on my, my, my Facebook 
friends. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my own friends seem to be polarized between those that have got their Facebook in lockdown and those that have just given up and adopted this sort of approach of radical transparency. Um, what does the panel think about Facebook and how social is affecting, um, is it affecting a real change in, in society about the approach to work and, and transparency or is it just reflecting the existing fact that some people are more open and, and some people like to keep things very private? Well, from a scientific perspective, I'm not sure there's any way to do an experiment and really know the long-term answer to that. And it's, a, it's a good question. Um, from kind of a practical, you know, sitting around the coffee table talking perspective, the, the social technologies have different cultures to them and different uses. And just to kind of uh, summarize Facebook, Facebook is all about making yourself look good. And it is. And if, and if you're trying to get something done on Facebook, like manage a chronic illness or above, if it doesn't make people look good, they're not doing it on Facebook. There's another social technology that may be better for that. So it's just, I think one of the realities of human nature is you want to uh, look good to your peers, you want to boost your status. Facebook has that culture very strongly. Now, and I think there's been some, I can't cite the research, but I seem to recall research that says it's depressing for people to look at all the, their friends are on all these great vacations doing all these cool things and they're locked in this cubicle <laughs> slaving away. It's like I have the lamest life of all my friends. So I don't know where it's gonna go and it, culture will change somehow, but I, I don't know how you would predict that accurately. I, I don't know how you do a true experiment to know. Andrew, I don't know if I answered that question. Maybe other people can do a better job. You bring up a good point. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg says all the time he believes that our various identities are converging. And I think in some industries and for some demographics that's true, like in technology, for example, I think at our company most people, it's not that they've given up, it's that they want to share their authentic selves with, with others. The challenge I have with that is for people who work in in highly regulated industries or in sensitive professions, like if you're, you know, you work as a parole officer or you're a psychiatrist or you're a police officer. I mean, there's there's certain people who can't do that. And so, how do you, how does this new web technology culture dovetail with their lives? And then the other breakage point that I see is with kids. I think, you know, growing up, all of us do crazy things, and you know, we say crazy things, and then people forget about them, and it's okay. But we're, we're entering a world now where every single thing is captured and it's captured for, you know, permanently. So people can't really make a mistake and that's not, that's not fair to kids. And, and I don't know, does it mean that you just not let them go on Facebook? Maybe, I, I know some parents who are that way. Do you just coach them to never make a mistake? I mean, that's no way to, to grow up either and that's something that concerns me personally. Next question. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for the panel. Really interesting. Um, I'm Dave Larker from Stanford. Um, let, let me, before I ask the question, let me say I complete buy into social media. I complete buy into the, the prospects and things like that. I guess what I'm curious about uh, are there any really good examples where it's clear that value has been created? Where you actually look at, show me the real cash flows that came out of this, you know, do the financial analysis and, uh, I've done a lot of this work in market research and things like that. It's incredibly difficult to nail down, you know, non-core areas where, you know, the systems are just not in place to actually track. You know, you don't know if the customer came in through word of mouth because they're neighbors or whatever. But I'm, I'm curious, particularly when you try to sell um, the idea to people that are, you know, 60s, 70s, where their primary instrument of, of communication when, the, when they went to college was the typewriter, and now you're scaring them to death about social media. You know, there's a lot of prospects. You know, they're gonna ultimately, the CFO, CEO, board members are gonna ask, you know, show me, show me the value. And I guess I'm curious, are there, are there really, I mean, again, I buy in to, to the whole idea, but ultimately, in a corporation, it's gonna, they're gonna say, you know, show me the cash flow effects of these things. You know, could you put a little color around that? Thank you. That's a great question, and it's something that Greg's data team spends a lot of time analyzing for our customers, for usually for their CFOs. And it depends on the kind of business that you're in. So the easiest way to calculate ROI is when it's an e-commerce transaction that originates directly from a Facebook page or Facebook ad, right? That's obvious. You can look at the click-through rates, you can look at the conversion, 
and calculate it down to the dollars and cents and you know that it originated there and then it's, it's click to close. Um, the second easiest way is, is when you can, if it's an offline transaction, drive in-store behavior or drive bigger purchases and you can do this through deals, you can do this through promotions that you then link back to that person in that particular ad or post on their Facebook page. And we do that. The hardest is with some of our customers where it's a very long sales cycle and social media, as much of a role it, as it plays, is usually only part of the story. And financial services is classic, right? You're never gonna, well not never, I shouldn't say, but most people will not hand over $5 million of their net worth to a financial advisor that they've never met in person. Even if they might meet that, even if they discover that person from social media originally, uh, initially. Same thing for life insurance or variable annuities. And so the way that we do it for that, and, and we've actually just um, been able to do the analysis for some of our, our longest standing customers, is looking at longitudinal data and being able to calculate correlative o ROI. And the way that it works is that you can look at, um, for example, 12 months ago, um, Dan connects to me on LinkedIn. And subsequently, I post all kinds of content about you know, how to save for your retirement, uh, what the state of the, the gold and silver market is, Asian equities and how they're performing. And I can track through you know, hearsay what Dan is clicking on, what he's sharing, what he's retweeting, what he's commenting on. And then now, one year later, th those specific activities are correlated with Dan either converting into being, becoming my client or increasing his assets under management or if it's an insurance example, he maybe has auto insurance with me and now he's also buying life and home insurance. And so I can attribute at least part of that lift to that social media engagement because I'm comparing it to a baseline of clients or, other, or prospects who in my database otherwise look like Dan but didn't engage in those social media activities. And so that's exactly how we've, we've done the correlative analysis. And even that, um, it's, it's been really astounding how much ROI there is because, you know, like to your point, we know it intuitively and just to be able to see this relationship actually deepened and this content actually positioned me as a financial advisor that people really trust as a subject matter expert. Turns out that when they're in the market, they think of me first and also, I help them realize that they need to be in the market sooner because I'm, I'm giving them these reasons and explaining why um, you need life insurance in the first place or why you should invest in these particular asset classes. Any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, just going back to what I said before, it's, it's a very difficult um, thing to measure directly oftentimes. So, I mean, Claire is in a <laughs> bit of a great situation in terms of measurement. Oftentimes, you know, especially with um, internal types of use cases, you know, you have people, sure, they're using Jive, they may be using email, lots of other things, and they may claim that a process, let's say, gets shortened uh, because of use of this new tool. But attributing that to, you know, Jive versus some other thing that happens, it's really difficult to kind of tease apart. So one thing that we've been starting to do with customers is really, you know, digging in with them, digging in with the CFO's office, and constructing ways or use cases basically where we can see and attribute change over time. And it's very difficult, very costly to do for everybody involved, including our customers. So we're very careful to kind of pick and choose. And as I, I was saying earlier, some of those use cases are easier and more directly observable than others. Um, but I think that said, there are some interesting new capabilities. So yeah, not all the ties or transactional systems are in place, but if you can um, you know, use some of these big data techniques especially that can crunch across different types of transactional systems and begin to do this kind of deeper analysis through cause and effect, I think some, we're starting to see some pretty interesting things emerge, and there's a lot more that needs to be done there. And I think you know, that will continue to improve, but it's a major area where the, the entire space needs to mature, I think. Too many claims, not enough proof. <laughs> Let's have two more questions, and it's time for the lightning round. Hi, my name is Vanessa Zucker. I'm from San Jose State. And I was uh, thinking that uh, we've moved from long hand blogs to like a medium format Facebook update to Twitter. 
So do you think we're getting more and more shorthand with the messages we send out and how we describe ourselves? And how does that affect information gathering and interacting with potential customers? I don't know if we're getting, I guess generally we're getting more shorthand, but I'd like to go back to the pyramid metaphor I was using earlier. I think the people who were blogging, a lot of the people who were blogging before, they're still blogging. It's just that now there are more expressive ways for people who are in the middle and bottom layers who previously were not participating to now participate as curators by liking or commenting or sharing. And so that's why, I mean, there's a billion network, social network users across Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. There's not a billion bloggers. And maybe there's some you know, cannibalization where people who were previously doing long form now all they're doing is curation. But I think ge generally it just has meant more participation across the board. And I'd be curious to know what others think. I think uh, what I see, at least internally, I see we have the status board so people can have a very quick update if they want, you know, a meeting they're going to or whatever. Um, but what we find in the dialogues that we're, we're having in communities, people actually write very long and, and quite thought out um, uh, opinions and, and give a lot of advice. So I think it's probably quite contextual. Um, we also see that with our customers, you know, they can be very brief, you know, we love you or the opposite, and they can be, <laughs> uh, we do get people that love us. Um, love, love a banker today. Um, <laughs> aw, <laughs> but uh, we also get very thoughtful uh, suggestions and, and, uh, and so I do think it's contextual about what people want to communicate. Sometimes you can be short and sometimes you've got a little bit more to say. Last question. Hi, good evening. I want to thank the panelists. It's been a wonderful discussion. Uh, I'm Chris Simpson with IBM. We had a fantastic conversation here at the table beforehand about the culture of sharing mm -hmm. and the necessity of the culture of sharing within either internally or, or externally for really deriving value out of social. Yeah. I'd be curious to hear the panelists' thoughts on that topic and, and point or part two of that is sort of how do you drive a culture of sharing within your organization? Yeah, so, so critical. and. For me, it uh, boils down to an issue of trust. Um, how can you establish trust between people who may not know each other all that well? Um, even within, say, an internal kind of company instance, um, yeah, I mean, social is great because you're quote unquote connecting lots of people, but there's still a lot of work to do in order to get those people to effectively share, contribute, um, swarm together uh, across a particular problem. Um, and it really boils down to, you know, good old human factors of, of how do you increase the amount of trust flowing through a system. And so there are lots of um, approaches to that, everything from team building exercises, um, you know, to I think um, one of the, the most effective things in an online sense has been for a lot of our customers um, just being very thoughtful about how they deploy and, and grow a new community. It's not about deployment of technology. That's the easiest thing to do. The, the hard bits are really around, you know, asking yourselves the hard questions, right? What kind of company are we? And let's be honest about our culture here, right? And let's try to fit together a set of approaches, tools, practices, norms that really fit the way that we currently operate, right? Because you're not going to fit some disruptive thing into a company and expect it to take off. That, that wouldn't work on lots of levels, and it, it doesn't for our customers. So we coach them through a, a pretty long process uh, after they you know, do a purchase with us of really understanding what it is they want to get out of it, what are their goals, how are they going to measure progress against those goals, and really drilling in this issue of, of trust. It really is the most fundamental you know, piece of making an effective social community, whether it's online or offline. So, you know, so that culture of sharing is sort of a, an abstract goal in my practice and people I train. It's like drill down to the specifics. What does it mean? You know, post this, uh, you know, comment and so on. Um, certainly to get people to share more or enter an, a, a post or what have you, it's got to be super easy to do. Simplicity changes behavior. 
I believe behavior happens more because it's easy to do rather than people are motivated. Next, they have to be triggered to do it. You know, bam, share now, what have you. They have to have that prompt or reminder. And then last is understanding why would anybody share in the first place? Uh, what is, what's their motive for sharing? And if, the, if there's some fear around it, guess what? It's gonna be really hard to get them to share. So trust is sort of like baseline. And then on top of that, trigger it, make it super easy. Um, within a corporate context, the, I think the psychology of sharing might be different than general consumer. So what I'm gonna say next, don't be shocked, it's more about general consumer. When people share and when things go viral, if you buy that word, I'm not sure I do, even though some of my students are awesome at it, um, they are sharing for their own purposes. They're not sharing to benefit other people. They're forwarding the video because it makes them look funny or smart or in the know. And I think those are the three core drivers for sharing in a consumer context. Not sure it's so true within the enterprise. There's probably, you know, let's do it for the good of the company or I'm a good employee, but maybe it, maybe it really does boil back to those motives. So understanding why would people share in the first place. So I look at those three things. That's just how I view all behaviors. It's gotta be prompted, it has to be easy to do, and there has to be some motivation there to do it. BJ actually has a very nice matrix available on his website. Like <laughs> yes, and I will teach you it now. <laughs> I think if you're gonna go into social in the enterprise, you have to already have a culture of trust. Um, I think if you don't have that, uh, it's going to be an extraordinarily uphill battle. Um, and, the, and the challenge is that you know when, when you first introduce social, you, you, you're going, and if you do it right, which I think right is open, unmoderated, you're not curating, you're letting, you're actually saying we trust you, um, you're going to get things that, you know, may not sit that well with people. You're going to get, you know, tough, um, tough feedback from employees that might never have been heard before. But I think, you know, sort of our approach to it was uh, no one was ever reprimanded for anything they said, whether it was in focus groups with executives and then as we got into social, when it went online. Certainly we'll do uh, training and coaching on, you know, ponder before you post and, and think a little bit about, <laughs> you know, how that's gonna play. We, we'll do that proactively, but not as a, um, uh, you know, coming down on people. And, and so I, I really think if you're thinking of getting into social inside the enterprise, you've just already got to have that great leadership culture, those strong leaders that have that intestinal fortitude that somebody says, I don't like that policy, I don't agree with your decision, I think you get paid too much, whatever it is, <laughs> that you're gonna accept that as feedback and learn and, and grow to be a better company. Um, and, and I think that's you know, a fortunate position for, for us and lots of companies, but without that, I'd, I'd be afraid. <laughs> All right, time for the lightning round. This time, no pondering before you post. The, the idea is to answer quickly. All right, okay. here we go. We'll start with Wendy and we'll go down this one. What industry has the most to gain from the use of social technologies? Banking. <laughs> health. Health, wellness. I didn't even hear the question. Yeah. What industry has the most to gain from social technologies? Oh, you picked health? Oh, and you pick banking? Oh. Don't criticize oh, consumer answer. retail. How do you know? <laughs> Lightning round. Consumer retail. <laughs> Impulse. All of them. What oh, industry is point. most threatened by the rise of social technologies? Clara, coming back the other way. Most threatened, you said? Hmm. Governments. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. David. Uh, legal. Peter. American Medical Association. <laughs> wow. Consultants? <laughs> What's up there? What's up there? In what, in, in what country will social have the most impact? And why? Uh, well, it started in the USA, so how about there? How about China, though? I met with the Bank of China. They're, uh, they have amazing social networks going there. I'm going to, China's a good answer. I'm going to go for Brazil because they're so innately social, they're very social yeah. people. Yeah. Two good answers. Um, I actually still think the US, uh, it could remake our local communities. I'd have to go with China. No Canada, really? Oh, what, Canada. <laughs> what percentage of communications amongst people in their 20s will be thro through social technologies in five years? Say that again, sorry. 
what percentage of the communications of people in their 20s will be through social technologies? All communications or just online communications? Online. 75%. Uh, 90%. I think 95. 90. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we were going higher. What percentage of communications amongst people in corporations will be through social technologies in five years? Five years? Wow. Uh, 50. 40. 75 percent. I think 100 percent because social will become a feature of all of our communication oh, and workflow platforms. Right on. You said five years? Five years? Okay. No criticism. This is a question. I'm clarifying the question. All right. What, what will be the next significant social technology company to be acquired? Pinterest. 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 Oh. That's a good, that's a good answer. Awesome. It is an answer. Yeah. That's a good one. I'm going to say Pinterest. Twitter. Going out there. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, what company is most likely to be the acquirer? Oh, wow. Facebook. <laughs> Google. Facebook. Google. Oh, interesting. What will be the next significant social technology company to go public? Hearsay Social. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. <laughs> Why are you high-fiving? <laughs> <laughs> I like it when people go public. <laughs> yeah. David? We're friends. We work, we're co-employed right. in a lot of places. David? <laughs> uh, next company to go public in the social space. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think it could be Twitter. I don't want to give a duplicate answer. I'll, I'll just say Pinterest. I don't know. I, I don't follow. I'll it. duplicate Twitter. <laughs> If you could invest in one social company other than your own, uh, oh what would it be? <laughs> oh my gosh, I don't know. <laughs> um, LinkedIn. BJ? Yeah, I think LinkedIn is solid. I, I, so I'm going to give a repeat. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter. I think after today, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. And what will be the most impactful application of social, social technologies in the next five years? Ah, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's, it's so profound. I think it's going to, to your point, it's really, it's sprinkled across everything that we do. And so 10 years ago, we were talking about how web technologies would change and what percentage of communications that we would do would be web-based. And it's just everywhere. It just permeates everything that we do and all of the applications and workflows personally and professionally. That's your lightning round answer. <laughs> <laughs> Please repeat the question. I was, I was listening to that. I don't like to follow the rules. <laughs> David? Uh, I, I think it's actually going to drive pe more